what do you love about weaving? I love everything. <laughs> I love winding the warp. There isn't any part that I feel like it's like, oh, I don't want to do this. Let's get this over with so I can move on. It's just uh, everything is very exciting to me. Hello, and welcome to the New York Guild of Hand Weavers Member Spotlight. My name is Katie Clements, and I'm the membership chair of the Guild. With almost 200 members, the New York Guild of Hand Weavers provides inspiration, information, and mutual support to anyone interested in weaving, tapestry, spinning, or fiber arts through speakers, workshops, as well as our lending library. Go to nyhandweavers.org for more information. Today, we will talk with New York Guild member Fanny Lee. Fanny is a first-generation Chinese-American woman. Her work reflects the differences as well as the commonality of the two cultures. She is a descendant of women who make garments, sew, repair, and mend fabric. Fabric and fiber are part of every culture and are part of the collages she makes. She was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, where she currently lives and maintains her fiber studio. Her formal art education was from Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, and she attended Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York for postgraduate studies. Her work resides in private and corporate collections. She continues to show her work through private and public galleries. In recent years, her work has evolved and her focus has been woven tapestry. This year, her work has been accepted into virtual exhibitions, as well as the Da Vinci Art Alliance Concentric Craft Show in Philadelphia, the Arts Juried National Fiber Arts Exhibition in Norfolk, Virginia, and the American Tapestry Alliance Tiny But Mighty Exhibit at Convergence in Knoxville, Tennessee. Welcome, Fanny Lee. Thank you. So uh, tell me how you got started in fiber art. When I was a freshman at Kent State University, I was walking the commons on campus and off in the distance was this woman sitting at a floor loom on the grass. And so I walked over and, and started to talk to her and she let me sit at the loom and I threw a shuttle and I was hooked. I, I signed up for weaving the next semester and that was it. There's so many things about that story that it's in the commons outside. I know. I, I mean, the thought of weaving outside, you know, with a loom, but it was just, uh, she was demoing weaving. And then what was your fiber art experience before college? None really. I, I sewed a lot. Um, my mother sewed uh, all my life. Um, when I was a little girl, she uh, she made pajamas for my father and her and me, matching pajamas. And my mother uh, spent a lot of time alone because she didn't speak any English. And we lived uh, in a neighborhood that we were the only Chinese. So she had very few friends um, and uh, she made things. She She liked to cook. But she, but she sewed, hand sewed a lot because she didn't know how to use a sewing machine. Uh, when I was in elementary school, my parents knew that going to school was very important. And the beginning of school, the school year, they would take me to like Macy's to buy one or two new things. And when we got home, uh, and this was also my childhood, my mother would re-sew all the buttons because she felt it was very important that the buttons were not sewn on correctly and you'd lose them. So she sewed all these buttons for any new garment that I got or, or, or my father. My father actually didn't buy very many clothes, but uh, that was important to her. As I got older, my parents bought me a sewing machine. I must have been about 10 years old. So I think that they bought it for me because it was a good skill to learn because other members of my family could use a sewing machine, but my mother didn't know how. When I got to junior high, I met two uh, very dear friends. We are still very close who uh, were also Chinese because the school had barely any Chinese in it. And it, in sixth grade, uh, we were the same height, the same size, 
and we were the only Chinese in that grade. So we became really good friends. And uh, Catherine's mother had a sewing machine and Catherine's mother had tons of fabrics and threads and all the accessories. And the three of us started sewing together. And that was a way to extend our wardrobe besides trading clothes with each other. Becoming almost a teenager, clothing was very important. And when you didn't have a lot of money, you could, and you could make it. I mean, you certainly extended your wardrobe. And because we were the same size, we could exchange. We never made the same thing. So we just exchanged and uh, tripled our wardrobe. And so then you went to college, you started throwing a shuttle, uh, and then that was undergrad. And then what was your postgrad like? I went to uh, Syracuse University um, to do weaving, and um, my work changed a whole lot. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was basically learning how to work a loom. Things were flat. The best thing about undergraduate school is that you you develop a camaraderie with other weavers and you learn from each other. When I got to graduate school, um, the same thing happened. We were only like six people in the program and we were all doing very different things, but we fed off of each other. So my work became much more sculptural. I started to use um, much thicker um, strands of weft and it became um, more texturous. And so my work changed and evolved. And um, when graduates, uh, during graduate school, I started entering some things uh, in, in Jewish shows. And uh, I actually, one uh, a one person show for the Everson Museum, and and that um, certainly was pretty wonderful. From from that, I received uh, I sold some work and uh, I received some uh, I see received several commissions, and then uh, we moved to New York. I wanted to really weave, but it was so tenuous. In, in terms of making a name for yourself or um, things like that. So I started doing sample weaving for um, the industry, the, fa the fa fabric industry, where you weave little samples of uh, yarns with colors and different colorways. And from that, uh, I, I got a job weaving yardage for a fashion designer who was, um, using the yardage of fabric to make garments. And I also wove ties for a small studio that sold to Barney's and high-end men's stores. And uh, I, um, but also I pursued other areas and received several corporate commissions where I, I wove very large landscapes to fill a wall. And then I had kids. <laughs> and so I put weaving on hold for a while. And when they got older, I entered the contract furnishings industry. From that point, I received a lot of fabric samples. I gathered a lot of them and I had a stack of just papers. At that point, I evolved into making collages. So I put photos together, uh, different papers, um, different found objects, and I spent the next 20 years making collages. I continued to work in contract furnishings and the kids moved out and we built a studio in the house. And uh, I got to a point where I could stop working in the contract furnishings industry and go back to weaving. That's where I am now. I spend six hours a day in my studio. It's been um, a salvation during COVID but uh, this is what I do full time. How was it for you to do commission work? I gathered um, uh, photos of um, ideas that I was trying to put across and, you know, put together different yarns and colors and uh, you, you do a presentation. Um, 
to the those people that made the decision. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a number of uh, commissions for the corporate world. So, uh, you know, uh, a few things got published in a magazine and then some someone else sees it and that's how you get around. And it truly stopped in the 80s when the stock market crashed because then corporations were no longer looking at artwork because they had to cut their budget and it it just died just like that. Tell me about your commitment of six hours a day in your studio. I often wake up in the middle of the night if I'm working on something and my mind wakes up and uh, um, in my, my mind, I'm trying different things. I come into the studio because it really is my sanctuary and uh, I love the light, um, the air. Uh, I look around and uh, I, I see where I am. And um, on the pieces that I work on, it's like, I can't wait to get back to it. And I really stop because uh, I like to work in daylight. And I find that uh, as the uh, sunlight goes down, as the sun goes down, it's harder to really see the colors and hard to see everything. So that's that's when I really shut down and start in the morning. I like to to get up about six six thirty and uh, come up here and look. <laughs> yeah. It's my it, it's my routine, and uh, I I think it became stricter during COVID because uh, because I have a dog and we have to walk the dog, so, and she can hold it only until like eight o'clock, <laughs> so we have to go out in the morning, and I don't always go if I'm in the middle of something. You know, the dog gets walked. My husband walks the dog, but uh, it's been. Um, it's just been an evolving way of life the last few years. You mentioned your husband, and I would like to hear about the influence and the moral support of your husband throughout your weaving. I have been so fortunate in so many ways, I have to tell you. Um, he is the, when I have an issue with something and I'm struggling, I, I ask for his opinion. He does not throw opinion to me. I ask him and then he'll give it. Um, but I respect his his um, his eye for balance, design, color. Um, so when I'm struggling with something, he always can come from a different point of view and look at it and just give suggestions. And sometimes I can agree and sometimes I absolutely do not want to do that. And, and uh, but it's, it, it, it's been um, a real help that you can say that to somebody, especially during COVID when you couldn't see anybody or, or be, have anybody come, come in to your home. Um, he he has always even we were in college together so this has been a process with us for all these years so uh he he's been a great influence in in um helping my work evolve because we can talk about it and uh he understands it that is so valuable it is it is what do you love about weaving Oh, I love everything. <laughs> I love winding the warp, uh, whether the warp is for um, a floor loom, I love going through the heddles. Uh, if I'm warping the tapestry loom or a frame, I love just going around. I, I love um, making bobbins and throwing a shuttle, but I also love just pulling the yarns together and then uh if i'm doing a tapestry just going picking um i love when you cut off the warp and you and you look at the back and all these threads are hanging out i love just pulling them through just to clean it up um there it, i there isn't any part that i feel like it's like oh i don't want to do this let's get this over with so i can move on 
it's just uh, everything is very exciting to me. I love the feel of it. I, I think that's what it is. It's the feel and touch of just the materials itself, and then what what you make. It's making. Um, how has living in New York City influenced you as a weaver? Um, I did not live in New York during my college years, and uh, coming back to New York always felt like your hometown and you does everybody want to come back to their hometown but i realized that i would not want to live anywhere else um new york has so much access to just art in general culture in general but uh materials that you need um people the diversity of people which is so important and uh there is so much acceptance of people here in 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 New York as opposed to other areas of the country. So I I love New York. It's it's my influence. Um, the park. I live near the park, so I I am there every day. So that's the nature that I experience. Every part of it is just pretty wonderful. What would you like most to communicate with your work? Um, emotion. Whether whether it be um, an emotion that gives you calmness, or 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 just feel good about looking at, or uh, emotions that uh, people are struggling. There were some things that I did during COVID that I feel like I needed to say something and I didn't realize what it was until it, I put it all together and, oh, this is what I'm trying to say. So. What a great vehicle to be able to express. Yeah, I. Uh, this is uh, actually those kinds of emotions uh, are very new in coming through my work. I I um, I always looked to design and and uh, colors and pattern, but not necessarily to create an emotion other than feeling good about it, than looking at it, and so. Uh, that is one thing that COVID showed me that I could create things that show that kind of emotion of, of um, the, the one piece I did was distress. Uh, um, and and uh, I, you know, I'm hoping that that shows in the piece. What makes you respond wow to another weaver's work? Oh, so many things. Design, color, technique, uh, how it was executed. I mean, so many things that I, oh my God, how did, how did this person do this? Trying to figure it out. Yeah, lots of, lots of expressions, lots of descriptions of, yeah. Wow, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and then to take it to your own work, uh, you know, you put it in your head and you think, oh, maybe I could use that technique in this way, mm -hmm. and and that's part of sharing. Even even if I don't know the artist, it, when you show your work and and you react that way, you you take in something which I think artists want you to take in so you know i want someone to look at my work and take it take in some of the things that i've i was feeling but not you don't have to feel the way i felt about it but it's it's sharing yeah sharing uh well let's start a slideshow let's share some of your work this this piece is called i met her it's uh nine and a half inches by nine and a half inches it was inspired by a collage that I uh, was playing with. The collage was not quite finished, but I looked at it one day and I thought, oh, 
maybe I'll try to weave this and interpret it with with yarns and fiber. So uh, I, I struggled with the eyes for a long time because the original collage is an eye of a uh, black man. And I was trying to cre recreate the eye. And as I'm trying different eyes, to, eyes are very hard to weave. So I did a whole series of eyes and then in my, I guess my sleep one morning, when I woke up, it hit me. I don't need to do this guy's eye. I can do my, try to do my own. And so I started to play with that. And this is why I called it Eye Matter. It's, um, it's a pun, but uh, I took it off the loom and I added some fabric to it and the uh, the fur above the eyes is actually a remnant I had uh, from uh, one of my coats. It, it fell off, it's, it's uh, fox fur and uh, it just came together. This is called Blue View and it is a, a collage with some fabric on it. Um, it's uh, it, it's adhered on a board. It's on a, a wooden board. It's adhered with beeswax. When when you're working with collage, you you, you need some kind of something to hold the things together. And I found that beeswax is very pliable and uh, I like the texture when you melt it and put it on, on top of paper, there's lots of things you can do with it. You can go back into it and, and uh, scrape it and, and give a little texture that way. But this piece came together truly just plain. Um, and when I got to, when I put the fabric on top, it w it was done. I, I just knew it. So it's called Blue View and it's about uh, 15 inches wide by eight inches high. How important is play? In it's, it's uh, especially with collage, you're putting things together. So when I say play, I move things around until they feel like, oh, this is what it should be. So I spend a lot of time putting things on top of each other. I like uh, layering things and, and I like the transparency of uh, some fabrics on top. So I, I truly is playing for me. I, I don't know another word to describe it because you keep, it keeps changing. Nothing, uh, especially making collages, no, nothing is final until you feel like it's final and then it's done. Sometimes what I've started to do is, if, for example, with eye matter, when I cut it off the loom, um, I looked at it and it needed something. It needed more dimension. And so that's when I started adding those other things to it. So weaving is part of a collage. Yes. 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 Beautiful. Th this piece is one of the pieces I did during COVID. Um, it, it is a result of uh, someone calling... COVID, COVID, the China flu, the Kung Fu flu, the, um, the constant uh, calling out of people who are not necessarily white um, and, and giving derogatory names. So uh, this piece is called Distress and that's how I felt behind bars, caged in, um, fearful, just lots of different kinds of emotions, fearful for, for getting ill from, from COVID, fearful of uh, other people, 
fearful of other people and what they think of me um, and, and not knowing where they're coming from. Uh, a lot of distress, basically. Very moving. Thank you for expressing this. Okay, this piece is um, 32 inches wide by uh, 28 long from the top to the bottom of the fringe. It's called Dong Tin, which means winter. And it's influenced by a number of things. Uh, Prospect Park, where I am there every day because of the dog. The uh, the trees, the um, the tree that is woven in the transparency weave in the center is actually a tree I photographed um, and and uh, made larger and and did the cartoon for for the weaving. What it is is uh, the photographs in the background are. Uh, a photograph on the images that are ironed on, and I ironed it on uh, uh, this silk, and went back into it and uh, did some stitching. The uh, just to emphasize different areas, they are actually well, close in to see that some of that stitching that you mentioned, yeah. and the. The two top photographs are actually placed upside down, and um, uh, they are sewn. They are there's two panels that are sewn together, and that's part of the stitching that's holding it too. Um, and then I took the transparency weave, and uh, I like to layer things, so I took the transparency weave and laid it on top of the, the photographs. And when I looked at it, it needed some color. And believe it or not, a cardinal flew by uh, the house. We In the morning during breakfast, I like to look outside in the backyard. And this past year, for some reason, there were just a lot of lovebirds and cardinals, which I have never noticed a lot of robins and pigeons and all that but i've never noticed a cardinal so i put the card i embroidered the cardinal on top of the tree so sometimes or most times when when i work i have an idea but i can't tell you exactly where i'm going with it because it it's constantly changing and and when you play with different things and and it's finished. You know it's finished. But sometimes in your head, when when you're starting out, you have an idea and, and you're working with it. But uh, it does evolve. It changes. I didn't know I was going to do this when I wove. I knew I wanted to weave that tree, but I I had no idea until the tree was woven and what it 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 seemed like it needed something else. So then I started to photograph and then put that together. Okay, let's hear about this one. The, these are penguins. That's the title of it. It is transparent weave. And the one on the left is the first one I did. Oh, I'm sorry, the one on the right. I'm, I'm looking at it and calling it the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. The one on the right is the first one I did and I wove it backwards. My cartoon was under the loom and I, I wove it backwards and uh, cut it off the loom. And it needed something else. So I thought, oh, I have enough warp. Um, I'll weave the opposite. I'll weave the same cartoon and and I wanted to try weaving it from the front. So uh, that's what I did. I wove it from the front. And uh, these these two pieces are in the process where they're hanging. And I, I'm not sure what else I'm going to do with them. But uh, 
I feel like it still needs something. I took some mesh fabric and I laid it over just the top portion of both of them. Is that the blue? Yeah, I oh, painted. Yeah, it. I was wondering. I painted on on it. I I just did some. I wanted uh, some feeling of some some atmosphere above them. So I I laid that over the uh, loose end warps. I I do like the way the warps hang down, and uh, I sewed uh, a rhinestone eye for each penguin on one on each side mm -hmm. and it truly is at a point where I think it needs something else but I'm not sure what yet but mm -hmm. I will go back to it at some point yeah. but I honestly the transparent weave was much more fun for me to weave on the right I wove from the back and then flipped it and it felt like such a nice surprise when I wove it frontwards I wasn't so happy with the dark lines and it could be that I don't, I'm not so familiar with transparent weave and that I need to clean up my technique a little, but it, it, I, I miss the surprise when you kind of flip it over and, oh, okay. Hmm. this works. Yeah. And I didn't feel that way about the one on the right. Okay. Let's hear about this. I took, um, uh, a class with Molly Elkind at MAFA uh, before COVID, actually. Um, it was called Collage into Tapestry. So the collage I made is on the left. And when I came home, I got on my loom and I wove the tapestry on the right. This is called Self Sketch. And it, it, um, I learned a lot about it. Uh, I learned a lot about playing with different techniques in tapestry and I, moving forward, I learned from those mistakes and, uh, it took me, it took a lot longer to finish this than I thought it was going to be because I kept taking things out. And, and redoing them, but uh, it, it was a learning process. And uh, this is the end of the piece. This is it. Oh, it's pure, uh, it was pure design, design uh, choices that I used the uh, pick and pick technique in, in the striping. And it was, uh, it was hard the, to learn how to keep everything very even. And so um, I, I am glad that I did it. But moving forward, I will know better next time. This is called determination. It's strength. It's, uh, it's um, a piece I did a long time ago. And uh, it was one of the first collages that I did. And I, it was, I played, I used beeswax, I tore paper, I put it all together. Um, I added color to the beeswax. Um, I added color by putting melting crayon into the beeswax. I, uh, and then I went back with uh, a very sharp tool and did scratches into it. It, it was a piece that came together very quickly. And uh, to this day, this is one of my favorite pieces of the work I've done. Beautiful. This is called Yellow Moon. And again, I was playing with uh, Citrusol is uh, a cleaning liquid that uh, when you brush on Citrusol with um, just a magazine picture and you you uh, take an etching tool and scratch into it, the Citrusol releases the colors onto your paper. And uh, again, it, it's from playing. Um, 
the yellow moon is actually a a magazine picture of a lemon and uh i it was just playing with different textures and and uh these the center torn paper is uh handmade paper mm. uh that has been glued mm. and the background is all citrus salve uh etchings that were have been uh transposed oh, so here's some your studio photos this is where I live. <laughs> this is where um, I spend most of my hours. And uh, the the wall where I hang pieces um, ch is changing all the time. Because sometimes I need to go back and look at something. Uh, I have um, self-sketch up there because I learned from so many things, mistakes that I made in that one. And because I'm, we, I'm doing tapestry again, I, it reminds me that this is what I should do instead of what I did there. Uh, some of your storage supply, very organized. It's because there's so much stuff that <laughs> you could spend a lot of time looking. And you made this coat. Yes. Is that right? Yes. I made the coat. I had started it many years ago and I picked it up again and actually finished it. This was one of the first things I finished when uh, I stopped working in the contract furnishings industry. Uh, the studio was not quite ready to, my loom was not erected yet uh, in the other room and uh, um, I just pulled this out and, oh, I forgot all about it and I can finish it now. So um, I put it together and uh, knit the collar for it and uh, it's done. And how is, what's the body made of? It's uh, a mixture of, I think three or four different yarns. One is a mohair, one is a, a lumpy silk, and and then just a wool yarn. And they're all about the same color, but it's a knit stitch. It's all knit. You stick your finger to make a loop as you're knitting to the next one. But that that's what the whole coat is made out of, and that's why it looks so bulky. The way this piece is displayed is just beautiful. Oh, now we get into your looms. The um, the loom in the foreground is a an eight harness Leclerc, Leclerc mm -hmm. and the uh, loom in the background is a counterbalance Hammett loom. Hammett is no longer in business. That was the loom I had in college, and the reason I had it is because. We moved around so much. Every every year you had to move someplace else because the landlord didn't like you anymore. You know, you're in college, you're renting a space to live. And so the Hammett loom is breaks down completely into two by fours. So uh through all the years and all the moves, it was in the basement for all the time I stopped weaving. Um so it's very dear to me because it's been with me for so long. Uh, the loom, the Leclerc loom, I I bought it used about the second or third year after I stopped working. And I bought that from a, a woman in Connecticut. And we drove up and and took it apart in from her studio and moved it back to Brooklyn. That's not an easy endeavor, is it? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was great, though. And I, and I still periodically send pictures of the loom. I said, I'm still using your loom. I love it. Here's a different uh, perspective of both those looms and your, your yarn stash and some displays. I can see why you would work during the day with that light coming in. Yeah, it, it changes at night when you turn on lights. And I have a lot of spotlights, but it, it's a different lighting. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, day I do prefer, even on a cloudy day, it's so different than working at night. Mm -hmm. And plus, I think by nighttime, most people get tired. Yeah. Their eyes get tired. Let's see. I, I see a serger in the background. Yes. <laughs> or what is this project? The, this is a um, baby blanket that I'm weaving for um, uh, a relative who gave birth in June. Lucky I, I actually did not know she was pregnant, so I, I would have started it much earlier. Beautiful. Lucky recipient. Uh, mm -hmm. This is another um, view behind that little clerk room. Oh, could you talk a little bit about the way you use these magnets or way you attach your cartoon for uh, a tapestry? Oh, okay, I learned um, actually from uh, two people. Mm -hmm. I, uh, when I took the uh, Mafa collage to tapestry class with Molly Elkine, she talked about how she did a cartoon and she actually sewed it sewed her cartoon underneath the loom or she sews if she's working on an upright she sews the bottom and she um she sews the top too but if you baste it on it's very easy you can just remove the the stitching um then the magnets was suggested by uh ellen ramsey who is a tapestry weaver who, um, thanks to Vicki Aspenberg in the Guild, had contacted Ellen because Ellen was doing uh, a six month stint in New York. And Vicki happened to see her weaving uh, and recognize the weaving. And uh, at a uh, the tax studios in Brooklyn, the Textile Arts Center on Carroll Street in, in in Park Slope, Vicki saw Ellen's weaving, saw Ellen, and said, "You're here. If you're here for six months, would you like to uh, come and and talk to me and someone else um, to talk about weaving and give suggestions and uh, let us pick your brain, basically." And so Ellen came to my studio and Vicki came to my studio and um, that every three or four weeks, we would get together for two hours and we would pick Ellen's brain and she showed us weavings um, of different techniques. She, uh, she was a wealth of knowledge and um, she suggested these ma these very strong magnets to move your cartoon up as as you roll uh, as you as you weave and it gets to the beater you can roll it down and the magnets hold hold very well I, I've used them ever since so this is a tapestry um, I started and this is. I started it shortly after I did uh, self sketch, and I uh, walk. I have walked away from it for it's like almost a, a year now, because I felt I was missing something. I when I started to weave it, I did a small woven sketch of of what I wanted to do. It's it's called orchids and it's um uh, a, it was a sketch of orchids that were on my windowsill. And I learned a lot through the small sample I did, but I started to weave it larger and I I stopped because I felt like something was missing. So I am actually getting prepared to go back to it. And I will probably just cut this off and start over again from scratch, mostly because uh, it will just, I feel like when I go back to it, I really want to get into it. And I don't want to spend hours taking out the yarn. I'd rather just um, 
cut it off, move the warp forward and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. When I'm showing this picture, I'm remembering how you said you love every part of the process. Yeah, this is, you know, a warping board is so big and there's only limited space and we had a blank wall in the hallway. So why not? Most people come up and you know, they say, people who don't know about weeping it, what is that? <laughs> I have a couple questions left. Um, what is what does being part of the guild mean to you? Oh, when I stopped working and knew I was going to go back to weaving, it was what, where else do you meet other weavers? You join the Hem Weavers Guild, of course, and um, it it's been wonderful. The the lectures. Uh, the the camaraderie between people, um, the the ability to talk shop to other people who understand if you're having a problem with your warp breaks, uh, just techniques, um, just really talk shop. It's nice. It's wonderful. I mean, we all do so many different things. There's always, you can always get inspired or learn from someone else. It's it's great. It's a camaraderie. Uh, last question. Um, what's ahead for you in your weaving? More play, more exploration. Um, when I'm weaving something, uh, I'm always thinking, oh, what what if I did a whole separate thing with just this? So just trying different things and there's never enough time. So I, I because I stopped weaving for so many years, like I'm I'm um I'm obsessed with uh getting getting my fill in. Well, thank you, Fanny. I could go on for hours. <laughs> I can talk shop forever. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll see you at the next meeting and hopefully before. Okay. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. If you like the video, please like, comment, and share, and subscribe to the New York Guild of Hand Weavers YouTube channel. If you're interested in joining the New York Guild of Hand Weavers, please go to nyhandweavers.org. See you in the next video. And until then, happy weaving.